All right, recording in progress is heard. Go ahead and get share the screen here, if I can do it the right way. All right, so we're right here. So my goal is to finish 1.7 today. And if I can sneak in a little bit of 1.8, then I'll do so. So 1.7, I did a lot of problems last time. I tried to show you at least one of each type. So I'll try to knock off as much of the rest as possible. For well, a quick reminder for 1.6, skip 69B, 71B, and 73B. They were beyond the scope of pre-calculus. They really belong in calculus as it were. Okay, then all we have left is uh, 1.8, Wednesday and Thursday for that. And first exam again is just coming Friday. Okay, and if I have time later, I'll talk about that, but I wanna make sure I cover the material that I wanna cover um, today. All right, so let me try to knock off as much of 1.7 as possible. I even wanna go back and do something from 1.6 because somebody had asked for that. Okay, so here we go. Uh, question about 1.6, number 73. So let's take a look at what that was about. Uh, huh. So page 54, a hotel with 125 rooms normally charges $80 for a room, but will give discounts for groups. If the group requires more than 10 rooms, the price for each room is decreased by $2 times the number of rooms exceeding 10. Express the total revenue as a function of the number of rooms X in excess of 10, All right? And skip part B. <laughs> Okay, so here's the interpretation of that. First, I made myself a little table, $80 per room up to 10. So if I wanna take 10 rooms, it's $80 each, but it says we're saving $2 off that price for each additional room, which means 11 rooms would be $78 per room, 12 rooms would be $76 per room and so on. Okay, so what I did was I let X be the number of rooms above 10, which means every time this goes up by one, this goes down by two. In other words, if I increase the number of rooms by X, in other words, 10 plus X, okay, X is the number of rooms above 10. I take off $2 for each room above that amount. So 80 minus 2X would be the price per room if I have above 10. Okay, so again, number of rooms, 10 plus X, <clears throat> the price would be 80 minus two X. And we can double check that. What happens if I plug in one? 11, plug in one here, 78. Suppose I plug in two, 10 plus two, 12. Plug in two, 80 minus two times two, 80 minus four, 76. Okay, so each room above 10, call it X, I get to take off 2X of the price, so 80 minus 2X. So therefore the total revenue, the revenue is the price per room times the number of rooms, right? So I just multiply these two. So the revenue function R of X is 10 plus X times 80 minus 2X. And I just put et cetera. The rest is just foil this out. So 14 rooms, wouldn't it knock off $8? I'm sorry? 14 rooms wouldn't knock off $8. It would knock off- So 14 um, would be down to, uh, right, 72, I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, so, okay. Yeah, so this is a pattern that seems to hold for that. Okay, so I wanted to do that. And now I wanna go back and do some 1.7. So there's a question about 41, so let me knock that off. But there's other problems that I'll do also, but since that was a word problem, I did do 1.741. The average weight in grams of a fish in a particular pond depends on the total number of fish in a pond. According to model W of N equals 500 minus 0 0.5 N. Sketch the graph and express the total fish weight reduction in grams as a function of the number of fish in a pond. Okay, the graph should be fairly straightforward. That is almost like Y equals MX plus B only it's negative 0 0.5 N plus 500. So the Y intercept is 500 and the slope is negative 0 0.5. So a very crude sketch would be something like this. Okay, N number versus weight W of N. Okay. 
So the formula is 500 minus 0 0.5n. So the slope is negative 0 0.5. The y-intercept, or in this case, the w-intercept would be 500. So I put 500 and very crudely, this is not an accurate graph. You don't want to make it accurate when you have numbers like this, but it's a negative slope. So I just have it come sh straight down something like this. And I put here the point 1000 zero, this graph is not the scale. So how did you know it's a thousand zero? Well, I just plug in zero here. So if I make this equal to zero, right? Zero equals 500 minus 0 0.5 in. Zero equals 500 minus 0 0.5 in. And I trust you can do the algebra. N equals 1,000. So that's where I got 1,000 comma zero. Okay. So I'll let you try to figure that out. That's easy. Maybe add 0 0.5 N to both sides and then divide by 0 0.5. So here's a very rough sketch. Okay. I know the slope is negative 0 0.5. The y-intercept, and specifically here, it's the w-intercept, I suppose, is 500. So that's the graph. And then for the total weight, the total weight is the average weight times the number of fish. Right? I take the w n and just multiply it by the n, essentially. So total weight is N times 500 minus 0 0.5 N. And that comes out to be 500 N minus 0 0.5 N squared. Okay, so that's all for 1.741 B. Okay. Will there be word problems like these on our exams? It could be, there would definitely be some word problems, not all word problems, but the kinds of questions that are just like, you saw here. Now I tend to give maybe 10 questions on exams. So you can expect maybe one, two word problems. So there's probably not gonna be zero, but there's not gonna be 10 either. So um, the I'm little, scenario is maybe one or two word problems. On the I'm a little confused. Like um, the problem itself, like the function, it says the weight of, of number of fish n equals 500 minus 0.5 n. So how is the weight not just this equation? If this is the average weight, so the W sub N is given to be average weight. So the more fish are in the pond, the, the smaller the average weight. So to find the actual weight, this is average weight, right? So to find the actual weight, you multiply by the number of fish, which is N. So it's N times the average weight. So they're saying the average weight goes down the more fish that are in the pond. I guess that makes sense because they're competing for food. So each individual fish doesn't get as much to eat. Yeah. So the average weight goes down, right? So let's say the average weight is, I have no idea, let's say it's three, okay? But if there's more, then the average weight becomes 2.9, then you add some more, it's 2.8. But then the total weight, you multiply by N, the total number of fish that are in the pond. So that's why you just go like this for that one. I see, I see. Yeah. I've been writing that correctly. Okay, cool. All right, so that's that one. And yeah, let me go back and do some more 1.7. Um, I want to do a perpendicular problem. The last time I left off with a parallel one, I think I said. And I want to do a perpendicular one. So 35. So find the slope intercept equation of the line, blah, 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 blah. So what did we say for 35? Perpendicular to y equals two minus x at the point one, one. Okay, so how do I do that? So perpendicular. Perpendicular means I want negative reciprocal. Okay, so what is the slope of this line? Well, it's the coefficient of x, which is negative one. So m1 is negative one. I mean, you can think of it as negative x plus two. So now I have to ask myself, what is the negative reciprocal of negative one? So you change the sign and flip. Well, the flip of one is still one. So M2 is one. The negative reciprocal of negative one is a positive one. Right? But let's say this was a negative one half, this would be a positive two. Right? The negative reciprocal concept, flip and change the sign. So this is my point, this is my slope. You can't get much easier, they're all ones. So I just plug in one, one and one. So, in my formula, y minus y1, one, equals m, one, 
times x minus one. So y minus one equals one times x minus one. You can pretty much ignore that one, right? Because if you multiply by one, you just leave it. And notice if I add one to both sides, you just have y equals x. So that's it for that one. Okay, and then let's see, 39. 39 for you. And I got a request for 37. Let me see if I have time for it. So. Okay, the function defined by V of T is negative 32 T to describe the velocity of a rock. Blah, 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 sketch the graph of V, determine the velocity of the rock when it hits the ground, seven seconds after it's been dropped. Okay, so this should be fairly easy. Slope is negative. And what do I get when I plug in zero? Zero, which makes sense. You haven't dropped the rock yet, so the velocity is zero. And then I drop it and then it speeds up. So it's a negative slope. This is not the scale, I just have it dropped. And you can see this is totally out of scale. If I plug in one, I get negative 32. If I plug in two, I get negative 64 and so on. And they ask for the velocity after seven seconds. Let's see, where was I? Right, did it hit the ground after seven seconds? So I just plug in seven. You have seven. So negative 32 times seven, Punch it in your calculator, negative 224. So negative 224 feet per second is the speed just when it's about to hit the ground. And that does follow our intuition that you know, the longer it's in the air, the faster it goes, right? So when you drop an object, it speeds up, right? So right at the beginning, when it falls, it's not so fast, but as it goes for a longer oh, period that's of time, why, that's it, why it goes it's, faster and faster. That's why it's going into the negative. And it's a negative, right? Down, down in the case. Because when you go negative, it's going, it's, you're getting a higher, um, you're technically getting a higher number minus the negative sign. That's what kind of confused me is that like, um, I mean, as it drops, it will go faster and faster. The rock goes faster and faster, correct. Okay. And yeah, you, I know. I'm just like confused convention. on why, why, why it's in the negative sign. Like negative 224 feet per second doesn't really um, make yeah, the sense. The convention is positive is up and negative is down. That's what we decided oh, okay. when we do our X and Y axes, right? We decided a long time ago that positive was up. And we just made that agreement. So since the rock is falling, then it's okay, we say it's negative. Yeah, if you just wanna say it's falling at 224 feet per second, that's correct. But using the sign convention that positive is up and negative is down, then we'll say, okay, negative 224. Okay. All right, then let's see. Uh, so VT, I want to go over also. VT is in terms of time in this formula. Can I see that again? I'm sorry. Could you say that again? Uh, on on the formula, where it says VT equals uh, thirty two T. Negative thirty two T. Yeah. So so what wh what is the difference between negative thirty two and the negative twenty down below when it's V seven? When time is seven, I plug in negative 32 times seven is negative 224. Negative means it's going down. God, no, no, I got that part. Yeah, okay, I see what you mean. So the formula is VT equals negative 32 T. They gave and me that formula, right. Got it, got it, understood. I got it, yes. Thank you, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Okay, let's see, 43. <clears throat> A new car costs $28,000. After three years, its value is $16,000. The depreciation of the car is assumed to be linear and blah, 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 blah. Ask me all this stuff. Okay, so the way I work this out is I plot two points. New 28,000, I call that zero comma 28,000. It's T, V, time versus value. That's like my X, that's my Y. So we're used to Y equals F of X. Its value equals a function of time. Okay, so you give me a time, I give you the value. So the starting value when I first buy the car at time zero, it's worth twenty-eight thousand dollars. 
Okay, and now they're saying by depreciation after three years, it's worth only sixteen thousand dollars, and we're assuming a linear depreciation. So come up with a relationship between uh, time and value. So I have two points. So the basic idea is once you have two points, you can determine the equation of the line. Right. <clears throat> so first I'll use the slope y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, right? So I go 16,000 minus 28,000, y2 minus y1, divided by three minus zero. So that comes out to be negative 12,000 divided by three, negative 4,000. So my slope is negative 4,000. And by the way, what does that mean here? It means under this linear depreciation scheme, the value goes down it depreciates by $4,000 a year. So every year that goes by, the car loses $4,000 in value. Okay. Then I use my point slope form, the y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 formula. And again, put these on your formula sheet for the test on Friday, your cheat sheet. <clears throat> okay, if you need it, slope. Again, if we were meeting on campus, I'd make you memorize it, but I'm not. And likewise, this one, I would make you guys memorize that we met on campus, but we're not. So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Okay. Again, they, they told us, okay, we're all in COVID, make things a little bit easier. So my definition of a little easier is I'm letting you have a cheat sheet for the test. Okay, so we're punching that in. So y minus y1, 28,000 equals m, the slope was negative 4,000 times x minus zero, x minus x1. Add 28,000 both sides. And of course, if you have x minus zero, it's just like it's x. So y equals negative 4,000 x plus 28,000. And that's assuming I have y and x, but they want me to use the letters t and v. So it's t comma v. This is functioning like my x. This is functioning like my y. So instead of saying y and x, I got to switch it to t and v. So v of t, y is the value, x is the time. So v of t is negative 4,000 t plus 28,000. So that's the way the value depreciates as time goes by. So negative 4,000 t plus 28,000. And we can check that. What do you get when you plug in zero? 28,000, that's what it starts off with. Okay. If I plug in three, plug in three, well, negative 4,000 times three is negative 12,000, and negative 12,000 plus 28,000 is indeed 16,000. Okay, so that seems to work. So every year, this car goes down in value by $4,000. Okay. Okay. Continuing on, part B. I can find it here. Part B, what is the value of the car after five years? I just plug in five. So V of five, negative 4,000 times five plus 28,000, punch it in your calculator, $8,000. When will the car have no value? No value, I plug in zero to the value side. So put a zero right here. Zero equals negative 4,000 T plus 28,000. Okay, and let's see, I add 4,000 to both sides. Divide by 4,000, so T equals seven years. So according to this model, the car has practically no value after seven years, it looks like, is what they're saying. All right, so that was most of the problems from 1.7. Yes, I know there was a question about another one, but I wanna introduce some of 1.8 and then maybe I'll go back and do that. So 1.8 is our last section for the test. Here's the homework. It's on quadratic functions. <clears throat> so let me at least give you the introduction to it. So just save me some time tomorrow 
and Thursday. So a quadratic equation looks like this. Y equals AX squared plus BX plus C. A is not equal to zero. So the graphs are parabolas. The easiest one being Y equals X squared. Okay. If I make this equal to zero, then we will have the quadratic formula, right? And we'll be doing some problems involving the quadratic formula once again, All right? So quadratic functions look like parabolas. They either go up or down. There's a parabola which opens down. A is less than zero. Okay, so what I think is worth putting on your cheat sheet is this on page 65. <clears throat> parabola goes up if A is positive. I think you've heard of that before. AX squared plus BX plus C. If the coefficient of X squared is positive, parabola goes up. If the coefficient of A is negative, parabola goes down. Vertex. Put this on your cheat sheet. The vertex is at X equals negative B over 2a. You can prove that using calculus. Okay, Vertex is either the lowest point or the highest point. Okay? It's a point where the parabola turns. Okay, So this is the lowest point if the parabola opens up. It's the highest point if the parabola opens down. How can I always find the vertex? If your equation is in standard form, x equals negative b over 2a. Okay? Now, I would say don't even worry about all this stuff. They go over a proof of it. I would say don't even put this, even though it's true. So I would say don't have that. How do you find a y value? Just plug in. Okay, so the vertex is at negative b over 2a. There's a derivation of it, and it can also be proved using calculus. But just put in your cheat sheet for the vertex, the turning point. That's where the parabola turns and goes the other direction. So on this kind of a parabola, it's the lowest point. On this kind of point, a parabola, it's the highest point. The formula is negative b over 2a for the x-coordinate. This is a formula for the y-coordinate. It's true, but I would not even bother with that. It's much, much easier to just plug in. So you do negative b over 2a. Let's pretend this comes out to be, I don't know, 3. I wouldn't do all this stuff. That's too much work. Just plug in 3 to the original. And that's much more intuitive to students, in my opinion, than trying to do this stuff. Okay, so the vertex formula is negative b over 2a. All right. <clears throat> All right, some things you want to put down on your cheat sheet also, and we'll do more of this in the next chapter. Okay. But here's y equals x squared. y equals x minus 1 squared. x minus 1 squared. The one is in red. So the blue one is x squared. They graph x minus one squared. It really just moves the parabola one unit to the right. Okay. Can you guess if it was x plus one squared? It wouldn't move the graph one to the right. It would move it one to the left. That'd be over here. So on page 64, here's a nice thing to put down. So I would say put this on your formula sheet. Horizontal shift of graphs, move a graph left or right. If you change f of x to f parentheses x minus, x minus c, the graph shifts c units to the right. If you change f of x to f of x plus c, like so, that goes left c units. That kind of goes against your intuition. You see the minus, you might think, oh, minus, I should go to the left. Actually, it ends up going to the right, which is counterintuitive, perhaps. Likewise, when you see the plus, you might think, oh, I moved to the right. No, you actually go to the left. <clears throat> Here are two good examples. And by the way, if you want to put something like this on your cheat sheet, you may. <clears throat> okay, so the blue is the original f of x. The red is f of x plus c. That moves c units to the left. 
and here's the opposite. The original f of x is in blue, f of x minus c, written like so, shifts c units to the right. That's where the plus and minus c is inside the parentheses. What happens if it's outside the parentheses? 866. Outside the parentheses, vertical shift. It gives you a vertical shift. And you might remember some of that from before. So the graph of y equals f of x plus c written like this. So I thought we just did x plus c. Yeah, the x plus c and the x minus c were all inside the parentheses. But here the c is out of the parentheses. This one goes c units up. f of x minus c written like that, c units downward. Okay, let me give you some examples over here. But this is something you want to put on your cheat sheet. So the original was in blue, vertical translation. Okay, and by the way, translation for us means to move. We know we have the English word translating, like translation of the language. <clears throat> but in mathematics, translation means to move, move left, right, up, down, and whatnot. Okay, so f of x plus c, c units up. f of x minus c, c units down like that, okay? So that's worth putting down on your cheat sheet. And let's see, it's just like in trig, exactly. We'll get to that more when you have trig. I mean, this is sort of a build up to what happens in trig also. Okay, so let me show you some standard graphs that they have here on page 67. Okay. Y equals X squared opens up. Negative X squared opens down. And as you can see, it's like the reflection across the X axis. If you replace X, F of X with negative F of X, it's just a reflection. Because all of these are positive, right? Well, if all of these are positive, you put a negative in front of the whole thing, now they're all negative. Now look at what's happening here. You can graph this on your graphing calculator if you wish, but I'm not requiring to have a graphing calculator. Okay, there's a lot of stuff going on, but if you see the blue one is x squared, the red one is 2x squared, the yellow one is 3x squared. So as your coefficient gets bigger and bigger and bigger, your parabola kind of gets more and more narrow. It comes like so. And you can go the other way if you have fractional amounts. So here's x squared one half x squared, one third x squared. So your parabola, which is like this, it opens up more if you have coefficient of a half, a third, a fourth, a fifth. And if your coefficient is like one over a million, it almost comes down to be practically a straight line, right? Then if your coefficient is big, like two, three, two x squared, three x squared, four x squared, five x squared, a million x squared, a million x squared, you know, kind of goes something like this practically, right? And likewise for the negatives. So they've got what? The blue one is negative x squared. So negative two x squared gets more scrunched in and negative three x squared is even more scrunched in, but it gets more and more narrow. It spreads out more if you have a fraction amount. So here is negative x squared. Okay, it spreads out to negative a half x squared and even more for negative a third x squared. And if you have negative a million x squared, it's you know, way out and you don't, you don't see the curve for quite a while, I guess is the way to see it. But that's what happens under those circumstances there, okay. All right, so we're gonna be doing all of those things in section eight, page, oops, 70, our famous quadratic formula. Again, if we were meeting face-to-face, -face, I'd make you memorize it, but since I'm having, you have a cheat sheet, if you wanna put it down, you may. If you haven't memorized, great, but, the solution to ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, where well, a is not equal to zero, is x equals, I don't really know why they put that one here. It's true, but kind of follows the issue. How about just go straight to this, which is what you're familiar with, right? X is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four ac all over two a. It comes from completing a square. 
they go over derivation of it, you can look at it or not. I'm not holding you responsible for that. Let me get this thing focused here. Um, so with the quadratic formula and completing the square are the same things or? Are, are the quadratic formula and completing the square the same things? No, they're not. I'm a little confused. Like the no, way it's you not, get right? The, yeah, no, it's the not. Way you okay, get the I'm, I'm back with you. Yeah. Completing the square. Completing the square gives you the quadratic formula. Oh, okay. So it's almost like, how do you get that formula? Complete the square. Okay. And now that we have that, we're not going to worry about completing the square most of the time. We just go straight to the quadratic formula. So if you complete the square on this thing, here's the derivation. This is what it looks like. Remember, it has to be in standard form. AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. So if it doesn't look like that, then you make it look that way. Right? Then, of course, you should know from your algebra, right? Just pick up the A, B, and C, plug them all in, grind it out. Don't forget there's a plus and minus. That's there for the quadratic formula. Okay. All right, so I think I've given you introductory things that you need from 1.8 before I do any problems in it. Okay, so we'll quickly go back and then tomorrow I'll do some problems of it. So we're gonna be graphing perhaps parabolas that either open up or down. So quadratics are AX squared plus BX plus C in standard form. The parabola opens up if A is positive opens down, if A is negative. How do I find the vertex? Negative B over 2A. I would say, don't even look at this, just plug in. Page 64, horizontal shift. Move either left or right. Page 66, vertical shift, move up or down. And the effect of having a coefficient on the x squared, right? So you can either make the parabola wider or narrower, right? So you have x squared, 2x squared, 3x squared, okay? or x squared, half x squared, one third x squared, fourth, right? So you're opening up like so. And likewise for the negatives, the negatives, they're all going to open down. And yeah, if you're uncomfortable memorizing the quadratic formula, here it is on page 70. And there it is. And of course, you can get this on the video later if you wish too. Okay, so let me see. Let me show you the problems and I'll go back. Somebody requested something back in 1.7. Okay, so 1.8, what was the assignment again? 1 to 41 odd and 45. And changing it a little bit. Skip 37, and for 45, just do A and B. So let me write this down, 45, A and B, and skip 37. So 45, just do A and B, and skip problem 37. See what that's about. Yeah, 45 has all these word problems there. So let me show it to you, for those of you who don't have the book and aren't getting it, page 73, 1.8. There's that. And that. Oops, let's just get it focused there. Um, okay. I'm a little confused. Um, the quadratic formula, like that's, um, how is that used when graphing? Like to find the use when graphing, you don't. Okay, okay. All right, except all right, except to find the zeros. Okay. Okay, and I'll show you that. Okay, meantime, I will go ahead and show you this. And how high do we have to go up to again? 45-ish. Okay, so let me show you. Can I show you this? Yeah, okay, it fits. So that goes up to about 41 or so, a little bit lower. Okay, there we go. All right, so I think you can see all the problems that are there. And yeah. Not just that. And by the way, you're not required to do any of the review problems, but if you want to, you may say, so I need some more practice, so you can go to review, but you don't have to turn in the review if you don't want to. All right, so that's an introduction in 1.8, and I'll begin doing some of 1.8 tomorrow, but let's see, there was a question from 1.7, um, problem 37, I believe. Find the equation of the line that is tangent to blah, blah, blah at the point. At what is the point of the circle with the tangent line be parallel to the line in the part? Hey, okay. Yeah, like I, um, 
I um I did something and like when I graphed it, it wasn't exactly tangent. Like I took two points from the circle and then um to find the um the slope, you know, and then um mm -hmm. since I know I, I knew it was a circle, I knew the slope kind of like I don't know, it should be a negative because it's going that way, you know, it has to be like tangent to the circle at that point in quadrant one. So I don't I don't know, you should just show me. Okay, well, let me just try it and see what's going on. So 37 x squared plus y squared equals three. And the point was one comma radical two. Okay. Whoops. It's a very crude graph. They say one radical two. Whoops. Come on. Let's see, focus on me. So it's going to adjust it. There we go. Okay, find the equation of lines that's tangent to the circle at one radical two. So the, the tangent line would go like so. And it's going to be perpendicular to this line. Right? So here is zero, zero. So the slope is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, radical two minus zero over one minus zero, which is radical two. So they're asking for the equation of that tangent line. Find the equation of the line that is tangent to the circle. So I just use the reciprocal, negative reciprocal, and this point. So this slope is negative one over radical two, which is the negative reciprocal of radical two. Okay. So it's perpendicular, means like that. So I do the negative reciprocal. I take the reciprocal, one over radical two, and put a negative. Okay. So I have this point and this slope. So y minus y1, y minus radical two equals m times x minus x1, x minus one. Okay, and clean it up a little. Y minus radical two equals negative one over radical two x minus a minus is plus one over radical two. And how about a rationalized denominator? Multiply by radical two over two. Y minus radical two equals, I can rationalize the denominator here, it's the same thing. So minus radical two over two X plus radical two over two. Add radical two on both sides plus radical two, plus radical two over one. Common denominator multiplied by two, multiplied by two. So y equals negative radical two over two x. Not very pleasant to look at. So my common denominator is now two, and this is two radical two, plus one radical two, so three radical two. So the equation of this funny line over here is y equals negative radical two over two x plus three radical two over two. So that's part A. Quite messy. And then part B, at what other point on the circle will the tangent line be parallel to the line in part A? So I think of taking tangent lines on the circle, right? So I just barely make it graze and like so. Well, it looks like there's gonna be another one exactly opposite, right there somewhere, right? These two lines will be parallel. Parallel, 
kind of draw the railroad track. Okay, well, you can tell by symmetry, if this is one radical two, this is negative one, negative radical two. So the answer to part B is just negative one, negative one, negative radical two like so. And that's pretty much about it. Okay. All right, Thank folks, you. So that's that. Let me show you quickly something about 1.8. Yeah, I know some of you had a question, but where are we headed? I'll start 1.8 tomorrow. So I think I'm just on time, just on par <clears throat> to where we are. So 1.8 tomorrow and Thursday, and just on Friday. So we're going to graph some of these things. Now here we can find maximum and minimum values because that'll just be the vertex, right? And it looks like we'd be using the quadratic formula. So we'll do some of that. Uh, 29, we're gonna move graphs around. I might move stuff to the left, right, up or down and so forth. And we have other miscellaneous type of problems that we have going on here. Okay, so I'll start some of that tomorrow. But yeah, anybody have a question for today? And somebody had something in the chat. Okay, so the exam, I will give you the exam on Canvas announcements just a little bit before we start. Well, class starts at nine, so it's maybe like 9.02, 9.03. I'm coming from another class. So I'll send them the Canvas announcements, then you'll join the Zoom. Um, yeah. I'll officially start at 9.10, but you can start earlier. And that would be fine by me. Okay, so quick reminder Thank for you. the test. Uh, let me get this out of the way. So you have to turn in all this homework by half an hour after the test ends, but you may turn it in early. So tell you what, how about once class is over on Thursday, you may submit the homework early if you wish. And now that you've done the quizzes, uh, do the same thing for exams and homework. Just, Click, 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 take a picture on a cell phone or scan it and email it to me and do the same thing for the test. Uh, by the way, give me two separate emails, one for the homework and one for the test. Don't put them together because I might look at the homework quickly and scan it and I might miss the fact that you have the test. So separate email, please, for the homework and for the test. Obviously, if you turn the homework in early, then that's a moot point. And we have so till we, we have till midnight Friday to turn it in, to, to turn in the homework. Uh, so I'll give you the exam around 9.02-ish, okay? I'll officially start at 9.10. Class ends at 10 o'clock. You have until 10.05 to submit the homework, and you have until 10.30 to submit the homework, okay, half an hour later. Okay, I'm trying okay. to do what's equivalent. If we were meeting face-to-face, -face, what happens? I would have you turn in the homework right when class is over, right? But that's too much work because you can't physically give it to me. That's why I give you five extra minutes to click, click, click for the exam another and half an hour. So you have until 1030, click, 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 click to submit the homework. But that's why I say, you know, if you wanna do the click, click, click stuff ahead of time and you already have the homework then submit it ahead of time. So I'm trying to go equivalent to what happens face to face. So what happens face to face, you would hand in the homework to me, you know, right, you know, on the day of the test you know, as, as you walk out, let's say. Okay, but that's not going to happen now. So that's why I give you that extra half an hour. So I will close at 10 o'clock. You have until 10.05 to submit the exam, to take pictures, and you have until 10.30 to submit the homework. Okay. Uh, yeah, five extra minutes for the exam, 30 extra minutes for the homework. That's correct. Okay. If we were meeting face-to-face, -face, what happens? Well, you would just get up and turn in the test, right? And you would turn in the homework. But you can't do that now, so... <clears throat> I give you an extra five minutes to click, click, click. And I know your homework might be bigger because you know there's a lot more work. So click, 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 <laughs> right? A lot more clicking. Um, so you get another extra 30 minutes for the homework. But like I said, if you don't want to worry about all that, just do all your click, click, click ahead of time. And then, you know, it's over and done with. All right, so uh, any other questions, please? Otherwise, that's it. Let me check the chat here, stop the share. And yeah, I think we're good for there. All right, so anybody else with a question? Um, I'll start doing problems from section eight, our last section tomorrow, otherwise. 
No questions. Questions? Okay, I'll do it for today, folks. So everybody have a good day. And we'll see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, bye. Thank you, have Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.